So today we're going to be looking at bicyclic compounds. These are compounds that have multiple rings that share atoms. And that means that not all molecules that have two rings are bicyclic in this sense. Think of a molecule like biphenyl. It's got two rings, two benzene rings, but those two rings don't share any atoms. They each have their own unique set of six carbons making up each ring. A bicyclic compound has to have rings that share atoms, and there are three general types. The first of which is spirocycles. A spirocyclic compound has two rings that share one atom, which I have circled here. Now that atom shared between the two rings is called a bridgehead. And it's called a bridgehead because if you think about it, if you wanted to go from that bridgehead back to that bridgehead, you have two paths to do that in this molecule. You can either go through the left ring through a four carbon bridge, right? And that would lead you from the bridgehead back to the bridgehead. That's the bridge. You could also do the same thing on the right side, right? You could go from the bridgehead carbon through a four carbon bridge back to the bridgehead. Now keep in mind that that bridgehead carbon in this spirocycle, that is an sp3 carbon, right? That means it's tetrahedral. And while this drawing may make it look like it is in fact planar, it's not at all planar. In fact, those two rings are essentially perpendicular to one another. Let me go ahead and show you a model of this compound. So here you can see a 3D model of a spirocyclic compound. And again, note the, the tetrahedral shape of that central carbon. The two rings are essentially perpendicular to one another. They're puckered to relieve uh, angle strain. But yeah, overall, you're looking at a molecule where that central carbon is in fact tetrahedral and the two rings are essentially perpendicular to one another. The next kind of bicyclic compound is a fused bicycle, which have two adjacent atoms that are shared between the two rings. So we have two bridgeheads now. And again, you can think of them as bridgeheads because there are multiple bridges that connect them. If you start on the top bridgehead and go through the ring on the left, you would go through a three atom bridge. Starting from that same bridgehead, you could go through the ring on the right, going through a four atom bridge. And then of course you could go straight down, going through a zero atom bridge. Now in a fused bicycle, the two rings can actually be joined together in either a cis or a trans configuration. Let me go ahead and show you some 3D models that demonstrate that. So here I have an example of a cis fused bicycle. And if you look, you can kind of see that the two hydrogens on the two bridgehead carbons in the middle are pointing up, right? Pointing in the same direction. And that kind of pushes the two rings down into sort of a cupping shape. They kind of cup over onto one another. Now, contrast that to a trans fused bicycle. Here you can see that the two bridgehead carbons in the middle, the two hydrogens attached, are actually pointing in opposite directions, one up and one down. And that actually kind of flattens out the molecule. In fact, if you look at it just right, you can kind of see that it's really just two fused together cyclohexanes that are in chair conformations. The third kind of bicyclic compound is a bridged bicycle. And here, the shared atoms have to be non-adjacent atoms. Now, bridged bicycles can be really kind of weird to look at for a lot of people because of the way we often draw them. So if you look at the structure I have here, you kind of notice that there's this bond in the back, this horizontal bond, and it's got some white space around it. What that's trying to depict is that that bond is spatially behind this other bond that's sort of vertical, right? That passes in front of it. And so if you didn't have that white space around it, it would kind of look like an intersection. And in, you know, in a skeletal structure, an intersection means that there's a carbon there and there is no carbon there. Now this same molecule can be redrawn by sort of rotating it along the x-axis and drawing it like this. So you can see the two bridge heads here, right? Those are two atoms that are shared by all the rings. If you look at it, again, we have three bridges here. Going from that top bridge head, going to the left, counterclockwise, you would go through a two carbon bridge to get to the other bridge head. Going around to the right, again, you would have a two carbon bridge connecting, the, uh, uh, connecting it to the other bridge head. And then you have this third bridge in this case that is a one carbon bridge, kind of going up right in the middle. Go through one carbon to get to the other bridge head. So here is a 3D model of a typical 
bridged by cyclic compound. And if you rotate it just right, you can kind of see how the bond in the front here passes in front of the bond in the back. That's why we have to draw it with that extra space around that bond. It's perfectly okay to draw it the other way, but oftentimes chemists prefer to draw it in a more three-dimensionally accurate way. So next, we're gonna learn some of the basics of how to name these bicyclic compounds. The first thing with any nomenclature, of course, is to find the parent chain. And for bicyclic compounds, the parent chain is actually the total number of atoms that are contained within both rings. We then add a prefix to the parent chain itself, kind of like we do with cyclic molecules, right? If you have a six carbon chain, it's hexane. But if it's a ring system that has six uh, carbons in it, then it's a cyclohexane. To designate that it is a bicyclic compound, we use one of two different prefixes to the parent compound. If the compound is a spiro cycle, then we add a spiro prefix, so something like spirodecane. If it's a fused or a bridged bicyclic compound, then we simply add the prefix bicyclo to designate that it has those two rings. Now, we mentioned before that the atoms that are actually shared between the rings are called bridgeheads because you can think of linking bridgeheads together with bridges of atoms. We finish the name by listing out the bridge sizes, the number of atoms that link together bridgehead to bridgehead, and we place those numbers in brackets. Now, this will make a lot more sense when I actually walk you through a handful of examples. So here we've got that spirocyclic compound again. So the first thing to do is to find the parent chain. And in this case, we have nine total atoms in those two rings. Now, it's two five-membered rings, but remember, they share an atom, so that means it's actually nine. Now, because this is a spiral cycle, there's only one bridgehead, so we find that, and then we simply count the sizes of the two bridges that link together the bridgehead to itself. Going through the left ring, we can see that we'd have to go through a four-atom bridge, and going through the right ring, you would again see that we have to go through a four-atom bridge. So the way the name is put together is we say that it's spiro, that's the prefix for spiro cycles, and then in square brackets, we put the bridge sizes separated by dots. So 4.4 four in this case for the two bridges. And then the parent name itself, nonane. So spiro, four, four, nonane. If you do in fact have bridges of different sizes, make sure that when you're dealing with spiro cycles that you put those numbers in ascending order. So three, five, not five, three, for example. So let's take a look at a fuse system. So remember with a fuse system, you're going to have uh, two atoms that are shared between the two rings, and they will be adjacent to one another. So again, find the total number of atoms in the actual rings. In this case, we have six, seven, eight, nine. Again, this is a non a Because it's a fused bicycle, we use the prefix bicyclo. And just as we did before, we now count the bridges, the sizes of the bridges that link together now the two bridge heads. So going through the ring on the left, we would have to go through, starting from the top bridgehead, a three carbon bridge to get to the bottom bridgehead. Starting again from the top bridgehead, going through the right ring, we would have to go through a four carbon bridge. And then there's also a zero atom bridge, right? If you go from the top bridgehead to the bottom, you can actually have a bridge there that has no atoms in it. So that means that the three bridges here are of sizes four, three, and zero. So we put it into the name. We have bicyclo, and then again in square brackets, 4.3.0 non -aid. Now, this is weird, but yes, with fuse systems, the actual bridge sizes are put in descending order. I don't know why they chose to do this, but they just did. So the full name here is bicyclo 4.3.0 non -aid. So last, we've got our bridged bicyclic system. So let's go ahead and name that. Again, find the parent by looking at the total number of atoms in the rings themselves. So in this case, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So this is gonna be a heptane. Find the atoms that are shared amongst those rings. Find the bridge heads. So I've got them circled here, the two of them. And again, we place bicyclo in front of it because we do that with both fused and bridged bicyclic systems. And just like we've done before, we count the number of atoms in each bridge that links one bridgehead to the other. So if we start on this front bridgehead and we move to the back, there are three bridges. Going to the left, it would have to go through a two carbon bridge to get to the other bridgehead. Going to the right, we would have to go through another two carbon bridge to get to the back bridgehead. 
And then there's this third bridge that kind of goes up, right? And that's a one atom bridge. So the bridge sizes here are two and two and one. So we put it all together very much exactly what we did with the fused systems. It's going to be bicyclo and then in brackets 2.2.1 heptane. Again, in descending order. The spire cyclic ones are the only ones that are quirky. They go in ascending order for whatever reason. So we have bicyclo 221 heptane. Now, bicyclic compounds are incredibly important. They're found all over nature in a variety of different structures. So here are a few examples that represent each of the three different types of bicyclic compounds. Here we've got the spirocyclic compounds. Here we've got lubamin. This is a naturally occurring compound that's found in a variety of species of nightshades, things like potatoes and tomatoes and uh, tobacco. And it has really powerful antimicrobial activity used by the plant to ward off infections. Here we have another spirocyclic compound from nature. This is erythrodiene, which is found in certain species of Caribbean coral. Here I've got a couple of examples of fused bicyclic compounds. The first one is naphthalene, which actually is not naturally occurring, but it is naturally derived. Naphthalene is what we make mothballs out of. And it's made from coal tar, basically just taking coal and cooking it, and the sludge that is found at the bottom is actually mostly naphthalene. And then we have a steroid, testosterone. You can see this actually has multiple fused ring systems. In fact, all steroids, testosterone, estrogen, cholesterol, all have multiple fused rings like that. And lastly, we've got our bridge bicyclic examples. So here I've got alpha pinene. Alpha pinene is actually produced by most conifers, most pine type trees. Uh, in fact, it's the main, main thing in turpentine. And it's also found in rosemary. It's one of the things that gives rosemary its flavor. And then here we have camphor, which comes from the camphor laurel, it's a tree. And camphor's uh, got a very pungent smell, rather pleasing smell. It's actually used in a lot of medicinal ointments and rubs and things like that. So those are just some examples of the various kinds of bicyclic compounds. And again, bicyclic compounds are really important. They're found all over nature. Lots of drug molecules that are produced are, are multi-cyclic compounds like this. Uh, and they're fairly straightforward in terms of their naming. It's very different in terms of the nomenclature, but there's a pattern to it, and it's really pretty straightforward.